What's crackalackin' YouTube? It is your boy Cosmos here back at it again with the Joust video, but not in Joust this time. Today will be a class guide, much akin to the Guardian video that we did a couple weeks back, three weeks back maybe? I mean, I'm not even sure anymore. It's a while back. But today we will be focusing on the Warrior class, the class I am most known for. I've played a lot of Warriors in Joust in my time, specifically gods like Akolan and Osiris are the ones that most people know me for. Uh, you guys want to take a quick look at the records, uh, you know, 99.4 on the Akolan, you know, average stuff, and then on the Osiris, of course, the broken god of the afterlife, the 56-0, the very classic, very classic, never been conquered in my entire lifespan. But let us move on to how you build warriors. We, of course, will be in the Osiris point of view here, as he is probably my favorite warrior to play in, in, in the ranked Jest. Just, you know, he's always, always a great pick. But yeah, let's, let's start off, as we always should, with the starter items. So the starter items you should be considering on warriors will usually consist of one of these four. Uh, the reason you'll build any one of them does vary. For benevolence, you're usually gonna, if you're going this route, you're usually picking a warrior that can go more auto attack based and you're gonna turn that benevolence into an animosity. With the Warriors X build, you're usually going, uh, you can do it with some of the auto, more auto attack based ones, but you usually wanna do this with warriors that have really good poke, maybe say uh, Wukong, Osiris, uh, you could, if, you, if you're a Nike player, you could go in on Nike. But, uh, yeah, this item is getting buffed in the next patch when there will be um, a list of what patch this is in. But, yeah, it should be proccing every seven seconds you can get a Warrior's X proc in this coming patch on May, May 18th, 2021. And this video is made May 14th, 2021, Season 8 Smite. I think, believe this is patch 8.4, but we are about to be on to patch 8.5. So Warrior's Axe is going to become a lot more prevalent, I would imagine. But Benevolence, of course, is probably the go-to still since you get so much money from it. Uh, Eye of the Jungle is another starter that I personally have been building a lot more recently. I'm a really big fan of Eye of the Jungle. It allows you to get some pressure on the jungle camps, deal immense damage. You can start killing jungle camps by yourself, have your team hold down the mid lane while you're getting to camp and you're standing close enough to the wall so that they can get XP and you can get XP from the wave as well. As well as the raw stats on Eye of the Jungle are really nice, allow you to be very aggressive. Kind of the opposite of Warrior's Axe, but Eye of the Jungle gives a lot of HP 5, 25 HP 5 while you're in the jungle. So it can help you a lot with that sustain as well. Kind of like a Warrior's Axe from a different take without protections, but instead with power and attack speed allowing you to be a lot more aggressive. And then, of course, I have the War Flag on here. If you've watched uh, some of, a lot of my content, you, you know that I like to go double War Flag a lot of the time when available, when it's really effective for a comp, because the War Flag passives do stack. One minion dies, neither of the dudes at the War Flag killed it, you get two War Flag stacks, 12 mana and 12 health back, in addition to that 2% attack speed, making stacking War Flags very fun, very effective, amazing sustain, and allowing you to add up that pressure. And then one starter item that's not on here that is also a very strong starter item is Blue Stone, which will allow you to do immense damage output, but you'll be very squishy. You do have that HP5 and MP5, but I just don't prefer it. But if it works for you, keep building it. Same with any of these other ones. Like if you, you're the guy that builds Death's Toll every game, it works in your games, build Hecking Death's Toll, man. <laughs> okay. But, ah, uh, now that we're past the starter items, let's get straight into the core items. The items I think you can get away with building every single game and be completely fine. And those starter items, or core items, are going to be Boots, Sovereignty, Talisman of Energy. And then, this thing. You always want this thing. Almost always. Very rare that you don't want this one. <laughs> but yeah. I only put the tier one boots here because there's not enough space to fit all the ones I want to fit on here. You could go pretty much any of these boots, except for Teleria probably. But the reasons you're going to opt into any of these boots are probably power boots. If you want to be extremely aggressive, 
your god's got really good uh auto cancels so you just want every auto that you weave in to hit that much harder the power on uh the boots here makes the biggest difference for your basic attacks because basic attacks benefit 100 percent scaling from power that you build so it's going to be very very effective on your basic attack weaving so that's that's the warrior tabby the reason you'd buy that trying to be super aggressive deal immense damage ninja tabby if for more of those auto attack based warriors say you plan on going a heavy auto attack base you want to get like a chin size later in the build you know going to get the animosity ninja tabby can be very effective on those types of gods so you're playing erlong shen so you're playing osiris so you're playing bologna gods that really use that auto attack speed extremely well. The Ninja Tabby can work amazing for you in the late game. And then Reinforced Greaves is the safest option out of all these three. Uh, typically, you want to build this one on gods that deal base damage better and don't have to worry as much about having uh, that power scaling, that attack speed that the Ninja Tabby and the Warrior Boots will give you so much of. But instead, you, you want to hunker down. You know your character does a lot of damage. Say you're King Arthur. Say you're Kakolin. Gods that have a lot of base damage, a lot of abilities, a lot of potential to deal a lot of damage. As long as they're able to do their damage without dying. And they don't really need a lot of power. So you can slap that Reinforced Greaves on really most warriors and be completely fine. If you're like a solo frontline warrior, you probably want to get these. Or if uh, the enemy team has some heavy CC... The CCR on these can be extremely effective. Gods like Ymir that apply a lot of CC. These can be very, very impactful for you. But yeah, you can build any of those boots, really. You don't really want to get Teleria. Just, uh, just does not give the stats that the other ones give. Not as impactful. And then the Sovereignty. This item I put on here as a safe item that you can build every game. And of course, you don't have to go these items. But this is a core item that you can build every game. Right after the boots. Completely fine. Unless they're like three magical, then you probably don't want to build Saw. But even if they're two magical, one uh, physical, Sovereignty will be very effective for you. Even though, like say you're against the two magical, one physical, and the physical is a warrior, let's say, who's probably not going to be hitting you that much. The Sovereignty kind of has is like a, it's like an invisible magical defense because of the net survivability that it gives you. Because if you look at this... Not only does it give you that 45 Fizz Prot, 15 Fizz Prot Aura, 250 health, which will be effective health against Magicals, but it gives you 35 HP 5, the equivalent of 7 extra health per second. Compare that to a health pot. A health pot will give you 10 health per second over the span of 25 seconds. 35 HP 5 will give you 7 health per second for as many seconds as you own the item. So you basically have seven tenths of an infinite health pot at all times by building sovereignty. In addition to immunity to the tower. Well, not complete immunity, but 60 protection early game for 2100. You are very tanky against the tower and you will live for a very long time. You take a lot of poke, sovereignty heals it right up. You have sovereignty and Isle of Jungle. You've got 35 HP five from the sovereignty. You've got 25 HP 5 from the Eye of the Jungle. You've got your base HP 5. You pretty much will have 80 HP 5 by the time you finish the Sovereignty. And you'll just be a walking hunk, taking all the poke you want and healing it all up just by being alive. And the third item on the core list is the Talisman of Energy. Kind of like uh, the Saw, but for the mana. It'll basically give you infinite mana. You'll be like, wow, I always have infinite mana because of this Talisman of Energy. Works extremely well in Joust because there are, you guys are always grouped around the waves, right? 3v3 normally, or you're always grouped in some manner. So you're going to be getting these Talisman of Energy stacks very, very efficiently, very easily. And you'll be applying the movement speed, the attack speed, and the MP5 to your team all the time. And it's just, it's just an incredible sustain. You get Sob and Talisman, your full health, your full mana, all the time. And it's great. <laughs> And then, of course, the Chalice of Healing kind of just adds on to that. So that's why this build is just so effective. You get, you get those three items online, and you are just so tanky, so survivable, and it's just so, so hard to take you down and get past that core of really, really nice items to have. So let's say you've got, like, like this. It is going to be incredibly hard to kill you. This build is super cheap. 2100, 2150, 1550. That's a cheap build, man. 
So yeah, those are why those items are there. These are core items. Build them every game. You're completely fine. Though, as we will get into, you can build other items. You do not have to go that every game. But yeah, as, as far as starts go, you usually want to start with one of the starters and then a tier one of either boots or an item that you want to go uh, after you finish your full boots. So let's say you're going for more of an auto attack build. Let's just put an example build of, let's say you went, uh, you went Kakola and then you're going, uh, or not Kakola, and you went uh, Erlang, you went Stone Cutting, you went this, you pretend that's a tier one and then. And then you go that, I don't know, something like that. And then you just get the chalice whenever it's convenient. You can get it at the start of the game. You can get it uh, like right after you finish boots is a nice time to get it because you really want to get that boots power spike online as soon as possible. And saving that 300 gold from not having the chalice can be worth. But yeah, basically whenever you have 300 gold available, it's when you pick up the chalice. Whether it be at the very beginning of the game, you started... Uh, Tier 1 boots, your starter, and a chalice, and a couple potions, maybe a multi-pot or two. Or you just went, like, Tier 2 boots and your 600 gold starter, and then you bought chalice after the first back, or after you finish boots, and then you have 1,200 gold. So, you, you know, you just finish it whenever you can. But now, let's move into the damage items. These are going to be more focused on straight dealing damage. You're not going to put that much hybrid items in here, because I don't have a lot of room, though we will talk about the hybrid items later. I've got Stone Cutting on here, Erendite on here, Chin Size on here, and Heart Seeker on here. They all uh, serve different tactics, different uh, purposes. The Stone Cutting, of course, is going to be for gods are going to be able to weave in those auto attacks a bit more. Let's say uh, I'm playing the Osiris. So God, you know, I have said I like to play a lot. You saw that 56 and 0. I might be going something like this on Osiris. Like, I'll finish my core, and then I'll just slap a stone cutting on there. And so that's that's my usual play on the Warriors. You start off really tanky, really survivable, and then you just go damage. Or items that deal a lot of damage, like something like that. And the stone cutting and the chin size pair really well. Because the stone cutting is going to lower their defense for that chin size, as well as give you a lot of power to make your autos just hit that much harder. And the chin size is going to go to town on them, give you that extra attack speed. And it's going to be really effective overall. So those th these two are more for auto attack base. You think you're going to make it to their back line or you're shredding their front line. You want to get something like this. Another one you could get is a serrated edge instead of stone cutting, depending on your character. can kind of be interchangeable for the stone cutting. And then these other two, you could always also do this on Osiris. Let's say like you think uh, you're going to be killing their back line a lot, but... It's a very, very mobile mage that's going to be very impossible for you to get autos on. Let's say it's like a Kakulkin or something. He's just slithering away from you. You can never catch up to him with those uh, with your auto attack slash. You don't want to be too close to him because you don't want to get uh, comboed by his three plus his ult while you're chasing him down. You could build something like this after you get your core items. The Erendite and the Heartseeker. You don't have to build them in that particular order. You don't have to build both of them. But let's say you just wanted the raw power. These are very good. They add a lot to your abilities. When you ult, you're going to be able to chase that Kakulkin down just a little bit easier because of that increased movement speed. As well as these items give a lot of power, so they're going to add a lot of beef to your abilities. The Erendite, or the Heartseeker rather, gives you 10% pen, so you're going to be able to you know, get through maybe a little bit of that natural protection slash. They realize that you're killing them a lot. They throw a Breastplate on there. It'll help you break through that. So that's what those damage items are for. And those items you're going to typically get later in the build. The exception is probably stone cutting. You could get that earlier on. It's effective as early as you can build it. This thing is 2350. It got reduced price from 2500 at the beginning of season eight. So this thing is real cheap, real nice to have. You could get it really early on. Let's say you get a, like a, a you're three and zero on the Osiris, and you're like, wow, I just backed, and I've got enough for stone cutting. It's not too uncommon if you get a lead like that. You have enough gold for that sucker, and then you can start killing fire. You can start putting massive damage on the enemy. Like, you'll shred their tanks. You'll shred their mage. Like, just really, really good all around. Like, if you get a snowball going, then you can go something like this and be extremely effective early on and shred any target, really. But, yeah, enough of the damage. Before we talk about the hybrid items, we'll talk about the straight defensive items. Typical items that you can build if you just want to be extremely, extremely tanky. 
So let's say you're planning on like camping the game out. Maybe you go something like this and then this. So you want to be like super tanky. And then they have two auto attackers. They've got Ao Kuang and they've got Ho Yi. You know, they picked a hunter and something else that attacks real quick. Probably not Ao Kuang, but you know, maybe they would. You never know. Maybe a Persephone where you could like really piss her off by lowering her attack speed. You could rush Witchblade after boots. Something like this. <laughs> and you could really make this Persephone mad at you because she's trying to explode her plants, but she's going like, Egh! trying to lift her arm up to throw that little auto at you or at her plant. And it's just not happening because you got the Witchblade. So you could rush something like a Witchblade here if you wanted to, and then you could go something like that or other sort. I think I'm actually going to change this right now to this too. Yeah, you could do something like this. But yeah, you can throw these items in. These three items here are more of a guardian build. So let's say you're playing a Horus or Mulan. You're more likely to opt into a build uh, like this. Yeah, Horus and Mulan are more like guardian oriented warriors. So they they do have the, the Sentinel's exception, if you will. Like uh, most warriors are not going to build this. But the Mulan and the Horus who are kind of just like physical guardians can get away with doing something like this and just building kind of like how a guardian would build. On Horus, you don't want to go Pridwin. If you didn't know, though maybe you do, Pridwin does not apply on Horus ult. Because as the high-res coding states, you cannot get simultaneous shields. Meaning, Horus gives you a shield when he ults, Pridwin gives you a shield when you ult. You cannot get both of those shields to occur at the same exact time. They can't proc at the same time. You can stack a Horus shield with a shell. You can't stack a Horus ult shield with a Pridwin because they proc simultaneously. And you get the bigger shield. The bigger shield is going to be the Horus ult. So Pridwin doesn't work. When you ult, Pridwin will go on cooldown. You won't get a Pridwin shield. Pridwin won't explode. You will only have the Horus Ult Shield. So, on Horus, you could do like something like that. Or you could do something like a Relic Dagger. Like the supports, the supporty Mulan Horus are going to have us quite slightly different builds than the more aggressive Osiris Kakolin are going to have. You're going to be able to go a lot more tanky on uh, the support warriors. Go something like, if I'm Mulan, I could go something like this. And then the other defensive option is the Genjis, which is really nice to have on a... Eh, I'm going to switch that back to um, Oni Hunters. It's really nice to have this on those tanky warriors. You can do this on Osiris, too. Let's say you're a, like a solo frontline Osiris, or you're just an Osiris who thinks he's going to get focused a lot. And you want to build like this to kind of survive. But they have a lot of magical damage. Let's say they picked... Uh, my classic example I always use is Poseidon or Scylla. And they pick, let's say they went Ganesh, Fenrir, and Scylla. Ganesh, Fenrir, and Poseidon, something like that. And, you know, you could go Sov, but you realize that if you get Fenrir ulted, the brunt of the damage is going to come from the Magicals, right? So the best cost-effective way to survive that burst would, well, it would be to buy beads. <laughs> but <laughs> through your actual items here, the best way to do that, besides the beads that you would hopefully pick up if you're against Fenrir and Ganesh, would be Oni Hunter's Garb. Because it will give you that survivability that Sov gives, but for Magicals, as well as overall survivability from the 9% damage mitigation, which doubles in effectiveness on Osiris because of his passive giving him damage mitigation up to a cap of, I believe, 16% damage mitigation against Magicals, which will stack with the Oni Hunters and make you a very, very tanky boy. So, you could go a build like this, if you were against that, and really worried about their burst. But after that, you can kind of transition into the normal build, and just go like something like this, and then this. Because your natural leveling, in addition to the... Or your natural level of scaling, rather, in addition to your items I that you're building, the jungle will be very, very worth it for you to go for more damage towards the end, once you got the baseline tankiness. That's a lot of the... That's a lot of the mindset towards building warriors, just in general, is you want to get enough tankiness so that you can live in a fight, and then once you've reached that baseline point, 
and that baseline point will vary from game to game. It'll depend on what god you play, what comps you're against. Once you reach that baseline, then you just build hybrid slash damage, and then you just overwhelm them with your uh, output that way. And thank you for the Prime Sub Destroyed 450. Appreciate it, man. But anyhow, what were we talking about? Defensive items, right? Yeah, I think that does it for the defensive items. Kind of went over the niche times to pick those up. The Thebes is more for the tank support warriors. Though you could get a late Thebes on an Osiris. Let's say like you just feel like you're taking so much damage. You want this build, then you want this, but then you're still getting absolutely pounded. You could pick up this. I would advise picking something like that up, but you know, you could pick this up to get extremely tanky. It's it's okay to build a Thebes late. You'll stack it up relatively quickly. And it's okay to get like any of these items later on. But yeah. That about does it for the defensive options, I do believe. And we can move on to the hybrid options. So the hybrid options, I think I'm actually just going to take all these out because there are a lot of hybrid options. And I can show you guys some hybrid options. Also, question in the Twitch chat, which I am uh, speaking to right now. If you guys want to check out the Twitch chat... It's where I stream this stuff live. You could come watch. Lemon Cookies 12 says, Have you ever played in the same games as any pro players in the SPL? I'm guessing you mean have I ever been in a game with an SPL player? Or you're not talking about am I have I been in an SPL game, have you? <laughs> so yeah, you know, while, while you're while you're getting back to me on that, let me throw up um some Hybrid items. If you are talking about playing against pro players, yes, I've played against plenty of pro players. Plenty, plenty. I remember there was one time when Trelly was streaming, actually, and we played against... Uh, we had to play against Cyclone, Weaken, and... I forgot who their third was. And we, <laughs> we just railed them. <laughs> and, and then they like got off and didn't queue joust again. It was kind of sad. Uh, Wowie is another one who used to play joust. Used to play against him a good amount. Where'd my Ankyla go? I already put it there. Uh, who's another person who used to play? Jigs. Hurry. Um. I can't remember. There, there was a team that used to run Fafnir, Cupid, Vulcan. It was Jigs, Hurry, and someone I can't remember. Played against them before. And then, of course, Paul plays a lot of Joust. I played against Paul probably the most out of any of the pros in Joust. And we got him banning Osiris and Achilles every time he played against us. And even when he wasn't playing against us, he would ban Osiris and Achilles. <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, that 56 and 0 Osiris. A few of those games are against the Pauler himself. All right, but let's get to these hybrid slash other niche items that you can build. Paul not playing much just ATM, yeah. I mean, he's got to focus on SPL, man. Okay, here's some other hybrid slash damagey items you can build. Void Shield is one. You could slip it in right here, maybe on more of those ability-based assassins. Let's say you're playing Osiris, but you don't think you're going to get those autos off. You can slip into more of a hybrid Void Shield, give you that pen, give you that extra ability damage, and your autos will still do good damage. Uh, you could go on Kile as more of an aggressive magical defense item. Let's say you're against uh, Cerberus, you know, a god that this is really good into. This item did get nerfed a bit, so it's a bit of a rougher... Uh, pick up but it can be good in niche situations like say against Cerberus like I was saying or gods where that interrupt on their abilities will really really help uh, cad shield bit more of a healer item of course you'd probably only be building this one on guys like Tyr guys like Horus guys like Guan Yu most notably this will allow you to get that little extra oomph that rod of Asclepius but for physicals will help out Serrated Edge is one that I was talking about earlier. You could pick it up instead of stone cutting, say in this slot, and then you go chin size. Probably 
most useful on gods like Osiris. It's pretty good on, though I like stone cutting more often than not on Osiris. It'll be really effective against people that you see are building really tanky, slash you realize you're going to be hitting the tanks more often than not. You're not getting to the mage, so you need that pen. And the lifesteal can be really nice, too. Build it on Osiris. You can build it on Erlong Shen. You can build it on uh, probably not Vamana, but you could build it on Vamana. Let's see what other warriors we got. You could build it on Br -br -br Hercules could be decent with it. Colin's okay with it, but I would build stone cutting every time on him. You could do it on Bologna. You could do it on anyone else? Probably not on anyone else. You probably would rather have stone cutting or neither of the items on the other guys. And that's not Osiris. But where were we? Oh, I think I just canceled my God Builder thing. Shoot, I lost my stuff. But uh, where were we? Serrated Edge. So Gladiator Shield was the next one. Item could be pretty nice on uh, Osiris. I've been going to build where I go something like disregard the starter. The starter is going to be changed depending on what you are, who you are, when you are. Been going something like this into this into Genji's. Where's Genji's? This. This is a really effective build. This will be uh, more often than not, in a, this is kind of a spoiler for a, a future assassin builds video, but this will allow you to be super aggressive and have a decent amount of power and a lot of cooldowns all the time. It'd be very nice to have this kind of build online. And that would be the core. But moving on from that, another notable item that I couldn't fit in here was Brawler's can build this if you want to do a bit more damage and have that anti-heal. A lot of time, uh, people will draft a lot of healing on their Joust squads. Like, the pick Guan Yu is very popular right now. Uh, some teams really prefer Chonga. You might run into the Afro main every so often, and you're going to want a Brawlers for that guy, probably. That can be really effective in that slot. The Sledge is another underbought item that you could fit kind of... A, this is actually a really good build for the Sledge. You could go something like this. Maybe switch the Sledge and Prid one even. You could do that. Either way. Really solid build. But yeah, these are more like assassin -y builds. You want to play like a lot more aggressive. But yeah, it's just like, they'll work on warriors too. Like <laughs> if you find, uh, you pick the right warrior in the right situation, you could find a lot of effectiveness with that type of build. Uh, another effective one is Frostbound. A lot of the time when I build Frostbound, I feel like I could have gotten traction, a lot more traction out of a different item. But, you know, if you like Frostbound, Frostbound's not bad. You could slip it in there, but like I said, I do think you can get a lot more out of a different item, but Frostbound certainly has its moments. And then another one is Toxic Blade, kind of the same thing as Brawlers, but you think you're getting a lot more autos off, so Toxic Blade can do the same type of thing. But for slightly lower cost, no power, it has the flat pen and the attack speed. The attack speed's the really big one, so let's say you're going Animosity, Toxic Blade could be a nice pickup for you. Uh, another uh, notable... Niche item is Mail of Renewal. I kind of am in the same boat with this one as I am with uh, Frostbound. I don't think you should buy this very often, but it can be niche. Say they don't buy any anti-heal and you just feel like you're outputting as much damage as you want already and you just want that little extra oomph to your health bar. Get Mail of Renewal. You could get that or Stone of Gaia would be accomplish a similar feat. And then Mystical Mail is another uh, notable option. Though you're probably only going this very sparingly. Say on a character like Kukulin. Like those characters that can output damage without needing many damage items. Say you're playing like Arthur or Kukulin. You go something like, like this. Max out your CCR. You're against Ymir. It'll give you that instant 40% CCR for relatively cheap in those first couple items. Something like that. Uh, spectral armor with hunters going crit so much in the SPL there are some people leaking through building crit on hunters and joust so spectral armor could be decent later on in the build say like this point but a lot of the time you don't need to get spectral armor because you're just when people do go that conquest build and joust on hunters you're able to shut them down quicker than they're able to get their crit online but if they do get to the point where the crit matters you could do that or if you're playing against like a Naja, let's say Naja and Ola run you could probably get Spectral Armor and get a lot of use out of it. Because Spectral will work against those Ola Run crits. 
in addition to the Najas, of course. And another niche item is a Breastplate. You're only going to really be building this one on gods that really need the mana. Like, really badly. Like, Guan Yu or something. But other than that, I think it's kind of like just like a bad Pridwin. Like, even if you're playing Guan Yu, you could go like, like this. And you'll still be Guan Yu, but more fight potential than a Breastplate would give you. Uh, another one is Winged Blade. You typically get this in a slot like right... Oh, I deleted my thingy. Like right... Let's say you're playing tier. Winged Blade's a good tier item. Let's say you go something like this. That's typically a good slot for Winged Blade. Or you can get it really early on if you're worried about their slows early. And get a lot of CCR for the cheap, cheap, cheap price. But more often than not, you're not going to go Winged Blade. It's super niche for, like, just tier. <laughs> I'm going to be real. Uh, another one is Pestilence is a pretty niche item. I don't like picking up Pestilence. I'm not a fan of Pestilence. I think if you need anti-heal, you should get it from a different source. But other people will tell you otherwise. And Pestilence definitely isn't a bad item. I just don't prefer having it. I'd rather have something else. I'd rather have this and a Cursed Onk. But, yep. Do as you like. Pestilence isn't bad. If it works for you, it works for you. And then Gaia I mentioned earlier, it's kind of like the same way, uh, point you'd build a Mail of Renewal. There's a similar thing, but like they don't have any knockbacks, like say, they don't have any anti-heal, but so like no knockbacks, no knockups, no things that proc stone of Gaia. Oh, might as well grab a Mail of Renewal or a Stone of Gaia if they do have those knockbacks. And then the only other notable mention I wanted to bring up is Runic Shield. This one's a very interesting one. This one is pretty good. If you're against really heavy mage burst damage. Or if for whatever reason the enemy team picks two mages. I had an Ama video a while back where I played against Scylla and Tiamat. Which they picked because we let both of them through. And then we didn't first pick either of them. So we gave them the chance to pick whichever one they wanted. And they decided that they just wanted to pick both of them. So we couldn't have either of them. <laughs> and I was on that game, I do believe. And I started like something like this and T1 Runic. And I finished Runic as soon as possible to get uh, that counter the mage item online. And it worked out really well. So that's a place you could pick up Runic. You just like worried about their mage damage. Let's say it's the same case. It's kind of like when you pick up uh, Oni Hunters. Like, remember I was talking about with Osiris versus Poseidon and Ganesh and Fenrir? You could pick up a Runic Shield, kind of, in a similar spot, though. You probably don't want to pick up the Runic versus that particular comp. There's a reason why I said Oni Hunters versus that comp. But, uh, yeah, just use your best judgment. The Runic Shield can be very strong playing against maybe, like, a Zeus or something. If you're really worried about his uh, early damage output. can shut it down quite well with Runic. But it is an item that you probably want to get rid of later on just because it'll fall off pretty hard. Because uh, a lot of mages won't care that you're reducing their power by 40 once you hit five items, you know? <laughs> All right. So, I think that about does it for the hybrid items. Finally, the darn hybrid items are uh, pretty crazy. There are a lot of them, a lot of really good ones. But I think we've finally gotten over that hump. And let's move on to the relics. The relics are obviously going to be a very important part of your game. You're going to have to make a very uh, pivotal decision on which ones you want to pick up. And it could cost you the game if you pick up the wrong one. So let's uh, talk about good relics to pick up, shall we? The first, the first four here are the ones you're going to be building more often than not every single game. And you'll notice that they are the exact same relics that I put on in the Guardian video. Because they, you know, they're just as effective and the characters are kind of similar in their play styles if uh if you can get away with it and you can play aggressive in the game that you pick or the games you're in this is the ideal relic loadout to have blink sunder upgrading sunder as soon as you can you can hold off on upgrading blink until later on but these are uh more often than not the relics that you want to pick if you can get away with them meaning they're not going to CC you into the dirt. You don't need beads. And they don't have enough turnaround potential slash auto attacks you need to block for you to want to pick up a shell. These are what you want to pick up. 
However, <laughs> most games, at least one of your frontliners, if you do have more than one, is going to want to pick up at least one of these for that team fight potential. You could have something like that looks really good. Something like that looks really good. Something like that is fine. And it all depends how defensive you think you're going to be versus offensive. Because, like, this is full offense, right? If you're playing full offense and your comp just has more pressure than the other team, you're already winning. It's, like, on you to mess up and allow the other team to win if your, t your comp has pressure over the other team. Because when you have pressure, you get to dictate the pace of the game. You get to decide when we go to fire. You get to decide, decide when we fight at the red buff. You know, all those, all those things in Joust where it's so important to be able to pressure and win a fight and know you have the advantage. These items are very good at adding to that pressure if you have it or getting that pressure. Like say you're getting blinks against uh, Persephone, a god that really struggles with characters that are able to close the gap on her really fast. Those are the types of uh, relics that you want. But let's say you're against Heavy CC, which a lot of the time you are going to be. Let's say you're against an Ares and you're playing a guardian like Yamoja. And you don't have any way to get out of Zolt, naturally, except for a well-placed 3. You probably want to pick this up. Or if you're against a Fenrir as a frontliner, you probably want to pick up Beads so he doesn't just bring you to his team and they just wail on you for 2 seconds. Shell, of course, is one that you're going to be picking up. Even though it is getting nerfed in the coming patch. Still a very impactful relic. We'll do the same exact thing that it does right now before upgrade. And then after upgrade, it's still a decent item. They'll block two autos, especially in Joust. Those two autos usually aren't going to amount to that much. So reducing uh, the basic attack damage incoming on you by 50% can be very nice. And this will help you win like an early skirmish a lot of the time or help you get out if you put yourself in a bad situation. I cannot tell you how many times I've been shell baited or not gotten a kill because they pop up the last second shell in that like first little skirmish you have like when the first waves meet after the buffs. And you like get a nice little engage going and you're like, I got him. And then shell screws you or the opposite way, or you're having an even fight, but they went two blinks and you went two shells. <laughs> you're probably going to win that fight, right? Cause you have like 300 extra health. So yeah, shell can be very effective, but usually you're going to want to pick and choose from these four other notable mentions. Oh yeah. On one more thing on those, you kind of just have to make a judgment call on which one you pick up. Like, if you think you can be extremely aggressive and they're not going to be able to punish you, you can start blink. If you think you're just going to get punished all game, you can go that. If you think that it could be really impactful, help you swing a fight super hard with a shell, you can go that. And then, of course, if you think you're going to be able to like, pick them really easily, you can go that first. And then you just mix and match those. But other notable mentions, as we're about to get into, that you can build depending on what the enemy team's got. Onk, if they have heavy healing healing that they can't stealth help but do to themselves. Like you're playing against AMC, his hives are going to proc the onk every single time, right? He doesn't have a choice. <laughs> if you're playing against... Um, who else? An Ama. If she uses her one, she's going to heal. Vamana, of course, is uh, patient zero for who to get onk against. But like gods that can't help but heal themselves is when you want to get onk. I think it can be kind of bait to get Ankh against Yamoja and Guan Yu, notably. Because those characters can pick and choose pretty well when they heal. And you can kind of bait yourself pretty hard by picking up an Ankh, and then you cast it, and they just never heal. And it just feels so, so bad. So you have to do a little bit of thinking with when you pick up the Ankh. But it can be very effective versus those gods that can't help but heal themselves. Baron, Vamana, Hercules, that type. Uh, another notable niche relic to pick up is Aegis. It's very good against a god like Achilles, who's going to execute you. That's how Achilles wins games, right? He gets an execute. All of a sudden, that turns into two executes. And then all of a sudden, that turns into three executes, and you lose. <laughs> you can prevent that by buying an Aegis. <laughs> can be very effective. But other than that, like you probably don't want to get Aegis unless you're against maybe a Poseidon Kraken or... A you're, that, that comp we keep alluding to with the Scylla and the Ganesh and the Fenrir. Or you're just getting bursted super hard. But a lot of the time, Beads will be better for you there. But even going like Beads Aegis as a tank isn't even that bad. If you're able to win the fight because you're having those good uses of those defensive relics. 
Another one is Sprint. It's another niche relic to pick up. Can be very effective against really heavy slows. Let's say they picked like Cerberus and Cupid. And they picked Tebow or something. Sprint can be very effective. But you can also bait yourself pretty hard by going Sprint. Kind of a similar to the Onk thing. Like a lot of time you're able to play around the slows. So usually you don't pick up Sprint. But it can be good. And that's a judgment call once again. Like most of these niche items are. Phantom is another uh, niche item you could pick up. Good against Odin. Good against Kabraken. Good against Ymir. Good against Yamoja. Same thing, though. You can kind of bait yourself by going Phantom because then you don't have one of these other options. The, the top four, let's say, that we keep that I was talking about earlier. Those are the ones that you want to get if you can. So if you think you can play around those walls, you want to avoid going Phantom. But you could even have your carry pick up a Phantom. Let's say you have a Thoth and he's just getting destroyed by this Kabraken, by this Ymir with his walls. You could have him pick up the Phantom because I bet you if he's getting owned by those, then his Aegis certainly isn't saving him. So you could go Phantom. Tell him, get Phantom! So yeah, and then another uh, one to pick up, is, a niche one, is Horrific Emblem. This one is a bit more like uh, iffy, kind of like uh, the Frostbound I was talking about earlier, where it's like, you think it could be really good, but then you actually get it and it feels really bad. That's horrific. But you can get pretty cheesy with it. And when it works, it works. It works real well. You're playing against a really silly Kabraken who uses his one-off cooldown and just runs at you and tries to stun you. After he does that, you pop the horrific, and then everyone's hitting him for, uh, for five seconds. <laughs> and he's really sad. But once again, you can bait yourself by doing that if like his team turns around and kills you, and then they have a shell because you have horrific. And they bought a more defensive relic, but you have horrific. <laughs> so you don't have shell. So yeah, the only other uh, relic that I think is kind of niche that you could consider is shell. Or not shell. Frenzy. Very similar to Sunder, but of course it's going to affect your entire team. And you're going to be able to use it on the entirety of the enemy structures, maps, minions, buffs, etc. So it's going to not only apply to the one target that's getting Sundered. It's going to allow you to... You know, spread out your damage to all of your friends. Usually, you'll get it in a situation where you don't really care about who you're hitting. You just want to hit someone, and you just want to increase your team's damage output. Maybe when the attack speed helps you out a lot. Like, you have an Osiris on your team. You've got a Hunter on your team. And that Frenzy can be super impactful. But more often than not, Sunder's going to feel a lot better. Just because in Jazz, you're trying to get that one pick. That one clean pick to just turn the game in your favor. All right. Well, other than that, I think the only thing we have to talk about are consumables, which should be a bit of a quicker section. And then we can get into maybe some example builds slash Q&A. Oh, we got a little early Q&A. Explain why meditation is the best relic in all situations. No, it's not. <laughs> med can kind of act like shell early on and you can med bait people and stuff, but yeah, Come that late game, you're going to regret having met over Shell, I'll tell you that. And yes, Dethrone, this is going to be on YouTube. Double med was a thing for early pressure? Yeah, it was. But now there's double war flag. If you, want, if you think about going double med or a single med, just think about going double war flag instead. And you'll be a lot happier. <laughs> Alright, anyway, on to the consumables. So I've got uh, the classic Chalice of Healing, as we went over earlier. That's the core item that you want to be building pretty much every game on these warriors. It's just too much a stain, man. Like, you can't not build it. It's just amazing. Once again, you pick it up whenever you can afford it. You can buy it at the start of the game with a starter tier 1 boots and a Chalice. You can buy it after you finish your boots. You can buy it before you finish your boots. You started a starter in tier 2 boots, but you got forced back early and you don't have enough gold for boots. You can buy a Chalice then. Just whenever it's convenient, really. And once again, it's always a judgment call. Wards you want to be picking up when uh, you're going to pressure fire. Uh, in that Guardian video, I talked about how there are like three entry points to Bull Demon. From the middle and then from both bases, there's an entry point. So you typically want to get all those spaces warded, if at all possible, when you do go for fire so that you have all the information on where people are coming from. And, you know, you can get sentries or wards. Obviously, a sentry would be nice to have on top of the bull demon if you know they have a ward on it. But most of the time, they don't have a ward on it. Sometimes they do. 
But if they are able to get a ward on it, then maybe you shouldn't be going for fire, you know? Like, if they're able to get there safely enough. <laughs> so, you gotta consider that. Other than that, we've got a Potion of Power. You know, you'll pick these up situationally. You can pick up a 500 pot in an attempt to make a last-ditch defense of your base. Let's say you got decided. They're pushing your Titan, but you could stop them. You just need a little bit more money. Or a little bit more uh, oomph. You can quickly scoop up a potion of power, leave the base, and save the game. Easy. Or, of course, you can get it later on in your build after you finish everything. But, yeah, potions, consumables are all, like, when you think they'll be good. Like, there are strategies where you can pick up elix no elixir of speed and just save up for 3k pots, buy no 500 pots. That works especially well when you have capped cooldown just from the items you build. A lot of the time it can help you. And then a lot of the time these warriors don't really need those 500 pots, so you can just skip out on them entirely and save up for 3Ks just because it really does not feel that impactful when you pick them up. Though Elixir of Speed can be really nice if you really feel like you need to sell your boots and get a different item. You're like, oh my god, they're slowing me so much, I need a wing blade. Oh my god, I'm getting owned by this Execute, I need a mantle to just free me just for that second uh, when the Execute's about to proc on me and I can get make my escape real quick. That type of thing is when you want to pick up a speed pot, when you really, really want that last item to put into your boot slot. And then another thing that I didn't mention about wards is a lot of time you'll see me pick up a ward, just like not when I'm going for fire, just like pick up a ward. And that's because I think the ward will do me a lot more than any other potion in this second slot will do me if I can get a good use out of it. Like, let's say I see someone jump over the wall with the Scylla 3 to escape me. I throw my wall over, or my th my ward over, and then I still have my Osiris ult to chase him, but I'd want to know if he juked back, if he kept running straight, you know, that kind of stuff. The information you can get from a ward just at a split-second decision moment like that. Or I'm diving his tower, and I'm diving a hunter, and he turns around and tries to kill me under his tower. I throw a ward down in f between me and him so that he tries to auto attack me but hits my ward instead that can be another niche use of the ward but yeah situations like that like the red buff's about to spawn and i don't have my free ward i've got a ward in my inventory i can throw it down you know stuff like that because walls 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 on the joust map are scary 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 getting caught around walls and knowing your corners knowing when to camp around corners you can uh, help yourself a lot by picking up some wards yeah, I think that does pretty much everything for the build portion. At least the, you know, the ones that I wanted to list out, all the items I wanted to mention, all the hybrid items and whatnot. So if you guys have any uh, questions for the AMA, lay them out. We could go over a couple of example build paths and my thought process to them on Warriors if you want to. I know we did that in the Warrior or the Guardian video. Let me find a longer game. Oh, we lost this one. This is 31 minutes. That was 31 minutes of pain. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, this game, we went double war flag. That was our strat to get some pressure, but this is a casual. You're kind of just, we're just picking gods. We did pick two pretty good gods, but bros did not have a fun time on the tier. But my thought process here was power boots, because I think I'm going to need to do a a lot of burst damage. I'll just let Tear get in the back line and kind of mess him up a bit, soften him up, and then it'll allow me to come in with my big power Achilles and really, really shut him down. I ended up going uh, Thebes after because I was like, oh no, this isn't looking so good. Someone's got to be tanky. And my Tear's not being tanky, so I got to be tanky. And then after that, I went Gladiator Shield. Gladiator Shield, you usually just buy for the raw stats. It's really good raw stats. And then get that CDR, and then I complemented that with a Genji's Guard, give me cooldowns like all the time. And then I went for some protection reduction on the Void Shield to top it off. Felt like a really good build. I could have got a anti heal, but I don't think I really needed it here. But yeah, this game it just did not go so great. I couldn't get many executes. I think I got one execute. That's it. But yeah, we got we got compositionaled. In this one, it was pretty rough. That's that'll happen in the casuals. Yeah, I don't know if I can be able to find an example. Wait, you guys got some questions?
The teleport to ward on Bull Demon. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> what is my favorite smite voice line? Uh, I see this is very related to what we were talking about here. I wonder if this works. Oh, it does. And that's a good question, McCall. I don't, I'm not sure. Ah, oh, these are good. These two matches are good. This is a longer one. This is that uh, auto attacky build I was talking about earlier. I went beads because I was worried about uh, getting Kuzenbo pushed into all this, all this damage. A little bit uh, questionable whether to get I should get beads or not. There, it ended up being really good because he got horrific. So like, if I hadn't gotten beads, I could have been in a lot of trouble. I actually did die because of his horrific at least once. I remember this game. And then I ended up going Sunder, Alma, character you don't really need Blink on because it's a lot, it's really easy for her to get into a fight, penetrate a back line. You just camp movement speed stance in her one and you're able to get there real quick. Slash, you can dash in. And then you've got your ult still to cause some ruckus if you need to make a great escape. Slash, you're going to be able to play more aggressive. So I went these two. I could have gone Shell. I could have gone Sunder Shell. Didn't really need the beads that bad, but they were fine. And then I did go the Benevolence build because I wanted Animosity. And then I went Ninja Tabby because I was planning on going these later attack speed items. And then I went the classic Sov Talisman, the super safe, give you all the health sustain and mana sustain that you need in addition to those nice movement speed attack speed stats. And then I slapped on the stone cutting and chin size, just damage, straight damage. And it worked wonders. I did, so, I did so much damage this game. And, I, you know, I, I, I'd, 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 I'd have to say I, I did pretty well for the team here. It really worked out. So, yeah, that's my thought process there. And then, why does everyone seem to find me in Corrupted Arena? <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm a Corrupted Arena main. What can I say? And then uh, here's a more of a support warrior build. This game, I kind of popped off. I got a big lead. So normally I would go like that build I was talking about early on support warriors where I go like Thebes Pridwin. But I was 2-0 at like the two minute mark in this game. So I was going to go compassion. I was actually testing compassion on Mulan though. Watchers or slash sentinels is what I would normally go. But I did go into Mossy this game. Didn't really do anything, to be honest with you. But it was kind of cool. But yeah, I went, uh, I was 2 0, like on my first back, and I had enough gold for Warrior Tabby. I started the game with Frenzy, so that we could hit, like, any of these targets. Whenever I just pop a Frenzy and be like, all right, go in, boys! And that can be really effective on Warrior supports, because they're typically very aggressive. And if I go, like, these double, like, really high aggression relics, can help us a lot in fights. So I went Warrior Tabby on my first back because I got super far ahead. And I was like, I can, I can carry this. I can snowball this super hard. I followed it up with a Glad Shield because, once again, the raw stats, the power it gives, just really nice for an, a hybrid build that's shaping up. You're really far ahead. It can be really nice. It's like coming out of the solo lane level 20, the enemy mid laner is level 17 type of thing. And then I slapped on the Genjis to get even more cooldown, even more abilities. Mulan passive already has like a built-in Genjis, but only for the ability that you use. So it's like I'm getting five seconds off the first ability that I use on them with this Genjis. And then to get even more cooldown, I slapped on the Witchblade. They have like basically two auto attackers between Gilgamesh and Neath. So I was like slowing those auto attacks down will be really, really good for me. In addition to giving me those really good stats from the Witchblade. And then I overcapped cooldown with this Pridwin, which is a bit questionable. But the Pridwin shield comes in huge for me. And allows me to be even more aggressive. So it's okay to overcap cooldown. I have 50% cooldown in this build. And I do not care that I have 50% cooldown in this build. I guess I could have gone something like Arendite here. To you know have a nice even 40% cooldown. And make all the haters happy. But I wanted a little bit more defense. And that Pridwin shield is really nice. I've got good hybrid items built up. To give me some good protection. And then as you can see. It really panned out for me. I went that double aggressive relic. Once I got that level 12, I bought Sunder and then upgraded it as soon as I had the gold for it. And it was able to perform very, very well in that game. But yeah, I think that's that. those are two really good examples. Like one, on the one hand, is the super aggressive 
super auto attack focused warrior and the other hand is the extremely tanky support style warrior yeah 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 and maybe i can find one where i go more of an ability based i guess this achilles one was kind of an ability based right that was a good ability based build but other than that more of a ranked game this one was like a clean victory from us back when i thought sh back when these two items were good i would not go these two items anymore really on osiris yeah this is a bad game to show off <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, before Osiris got, uh, or the shifters and Ankele got nerfed. And I don't think they're really worth picking up that much anymore. But yeah, I think, guys, that's going to do it for how to build warriors in ranked Joust. Hopefully you uh, picked up a tip or two, maybe learned a few things, slash decided I was a complete idiot and that your builds are way better and uh, I'm dumb. And that's okay, too. As, as we always say... If you find a build, and I, you know, doesn't matter what I think of it. If you find a build that works for you, and it's just like, oh, I'm going 20 and 0 on this every game in my uh, gold three games, you know, and uh, I build Deathbringer Osiris, and it works every time. Like, do it. Go ahead. If it works in your games, build it. So yeah, I love to hear your guys' opinions on this. What you build, maybe that I don't build, or you leave a comment on what you do build if you think there are some shortcomings to it. Go ahead and ask me. I'll be as responsive as possible in the comments. But yeah, I'm a very tenured warrior player. I know a lot about building those characters. So I hope I did help you guys out just even a little bit. But yeah, until next time, guys. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel as well as if you want to watch this live, go to the Twitch channel link in the description. But yeah, until next time, guys. See you later.